welcome to the Rock Matters podcasting from the Old Railway Depot in Swamp Poodle, Washington, D.C. Hi, dear listeners, Shakumaku. This is Tyre Jani. And I'm Asha Ahmed. Thank you for tuning in to Iraq Matters, an epic podcast of news, ideas, and conversations about Iraq. Before we begin, we have some news to report. Here in Washington, D.C., the House Committee on Foreign Affairs and the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations held full committee hearings on Iraq on July 23rd and July 24th. Both hearings focused on the political and security dimensions of the Iraq crisis. Unfortunately, no witnesses were called to testify on the humanitarian and human rights dimensions. Nevertheless, in both hearings, members of Congress raised humanitarian concerns. Namely, we'd like to take a moment to commend Congressman David Cicilline of Rhode Island and Senator Jean Shaheen of New Hampshire, who directed specific questions to Brett McGurk about the effort to respond to the growing humanitarian emergency in Iraq. We hope to see further congressional hearings and action following the August recess. You can help by contacting your elected representatives and urging them to do more to press the Obama administration to strengthen U.S. humanitarian engagement in Iraq. You can count on EPIC continuing to be engaged in Iraq. We are currently chairing a working group of internationally respected organizations that are concerned about the crisis in Iraq. Last week, EPIC and 35 non-governmental organizations and mainline faith institutions joined together to publicly send a letter to U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry calling for a robust long-term U.S. response to the growing humanitarian and human rights crisis in Iraq. That's right, Taif. We're really excited about the broad support that the letter has garnered. I mean, you really have to see this list of 36 signatory parties. Save the Children, Mercy Corps, the International Rescue Committee, Catholic Relief Services, Refugees International, Human Rights Watch, the National Council of Churches, and the Presbyterian Church USA, and the list just goes on from there. Awesome. So, Asha, on July 22nd, you interviewed Epic's old friend and colleague, Christine Van de Torn, an American researcher based in northern Iraq. Yes, Christine joined me via Skype from Salonia, a city in the Kurdistan region of Iraq. We had a great discussion about recent developments in Iraq. A particular focus of our conversation was the city of Mosul and the surrounding countryside in Nineveh province, an area where she has devoted a lot of her time. Before we move on to the interview, we wanted to take a moment to explain three terms that Christine uses. First is Daesh. Daesh is the Arabic acronym for ISIS, or the Islamic State of Iraq and Greater Syria, the Al-Qaeda splinter group that has been fighting in both Iraq and Syria. With the cooperation of some tribal militias and other insurgent groups in Iraq, Daesh has seized control of the city of Mosul and a large expanse of territory stretching from al Anbar province in the west all the way to parts of Diyala in Iraq's northeast. Second, we have the Peshmerga. The Peshmerga are the armed forces of the Kurdistan regional government. Since 2003, the Peshmerga have held territories outside of the constitutionally recognized Kurdistan region of Iraq and contested by Iraq's central government. More recently, the Peshmerga have seized control of Kirkuk and other areas abandoned by the Iraqi security forces. Lastly, we have Jaysh of the Men of the Akashbandi Order, or JRTN, an Iraqi nationalist militant group that includes former military commanders and senior Ba'athists from Saddam Hussein's regime. They appropriated their name from a renowned Sufi order popular in Iraq, the Nakashbandi, and reportedly have members of the order within their ranks. The JRTN is one of the groups that has nominally assisted the rapid advance of ISIS, or Daesh, by fighting the Iraqi security forces in Peshmerga and in seizing and holding territory. Thanks, Dasha. Be sure to stay tuned until the end for an update on EPIC's fieldwork, including Tent Ed, an initiative to help Syrian refugees in Iraq and our photo voice project with Iraqi university students. Now, we'd like to invite you to sit back and enjoy our interview with Christine Van den Torn. Hi, Christine. How are you? I'm well. How are you all? Thanks for having me. No problem. We're doing really well. We're excited to interview again after our last interview with you. Yes, me too. Okay, let's get started. We wanted to start with talking about the security crisis. Sure. 
Since you were in northern Iraq when Mosul was seized by ISIS and associated groups, you have a unique perspective on what happened and what the situation was like. In your view, what happened and how did it happen? Well, about Mosul, there are, you know, so many competing narratives about why the army left how they left, why it happened so quickly. And frankly, I think it'll take us years of interviews among, you know, soldiers and generals to figure out what exactly happened. I mean, in my perspective, from what I've read and from people I've talked to, it seems like to me that it was really kind of a breakdown of the chain of command. I mean, I think that officers left left and therefore soldiers did not have orders and if a soldier doesn't have an order a soldier doesn't know what to do and the soldiers are going to leave and i think the question that still remains is were officers ordered to leave or did they leave on their own i honestly don't feel comfortable answering that question you know but i think that's the important thing to figure out the corruption and the kind of disorder is widespread in the Iraq army. Um, And I think it has been for a long time. So I think we can speak very generally about the issues of the Iraq army, but whether those officers had orders to leave, whether they were told don't defend Mosul, or, you know, whether they said, holy smokes, we don't know what to do. Daesh or ISIS just came into town. We're gonna leave is still, I think, up in the air. Yeah, I know it's very confusing and yeah. it because it was so rapid, like you said. Yeah. And it just seemed overnight. Yeah, I mean, I think at the very least what you just said, we can we can say 100%. It was rapid and it happened very quickly. So figuring out why it occurred so quickly, such a large city with such a massive military force could fall to what people have said was a few hundred to maybe a thousand armed men is something that needs to be studied. Definitely. Over the past month, how has the security situation changed in Mosul and the surrounding area? Well, I feel a little bit more comfortable talking about the surrounding area. Things are so complicated. I mean, one of the fascinating things I kind of know about is to the west of Mosul, it's a patchwork of KRG, Peshmerga controlled districts to Daesh controlled districts, you know, the district immediately west of Mosul Tel Afar, which was of course, a Tur- was, I hope will be in the future, but a Turkmen mixed Sunni Shia Turkmen town is now controlled by Daesh. And then immediately to the west of that, Sinjar, which is Shingal and Kurdish, is controlled by the Peshmerga, by KRG, which it was before. I mean, it's a disputed territory, but now you have further KRG presence there. That's, of course, majority Yazidi. But you have districts like Belij that are technically in Sinjar district that are controlled by Daesh or not really controlled by anyone. I hate to make it a ethno sectarian thing, but those are majority Sunni Arab places in Sinjar that the Peshmerga don't want to protect or say are outside the places that they can and want to control. And then just kind of actually northwest of Sinjar, you have Rabia, which is on the border with Syria, which was controlled by the Iraq army and is now controlled by Peshmerga, by KRG. However, there have been a lot of attacks in Rabia. So while it is under KRG Peshmerga control, it is not safe. There have been two that I can remember in the past several weeks, Shia Turkmen families that have been attacked. And then of course, to the east of Mosul, you have all these majority minority places, Christian, Yazidi, Shebek communities of Bartola and Bashika and Karakosh that are KRG Peshmerga protected. But you know, you can see from Karakosh, these areas are so close to to Daesh controlled Mosul. So it's very close quarters out there between Daesh and the Peshmerga. I've definitely heard secondhand reports, like my friends who have talked to people inside Mosul and stuff like that. Mm -hmm that over the last, I guess, 10 days, you know, we've all heard a lot about how who controls Mosul, that the neighborhoods have been divided between various either 
Bathy officers, um, the Nakashbandi, all these people. And, and we've kind of heard, and who knows from just a couple accounts what's true, but that there has been a little bit of a departure by Daesh, at least maybe main commanders from the city as they move down south, southeast to, to Crete in planning some kind of future attack on Baghdad that we're still not sure about. Yeah, I've heard similar things that the ISIS's presence in Mosul has definitely changed a bit, but it's interesting to hear how in the surrounding areas that that narrative is different. Yeah, that's right. And to go back to the Iraqi security forces, since they collapsed in the wake of the fall of Mosul, do you know what the current state of them is? Like, have they made any progress? Not in Mosul. I mean, it's the strangest thing. You know, you have YouTube videos of ISIS parades in Mosul and no airstrikes. So I obviously know that there are problems with airstrikes in terms of civilian casualties, but there and there have been these kind of scattered airstrikes, but nothing like an attack. I mean, I think the concentration of forces is, you know, Samarra, and this everlasting battle for Tikrit, which is every day reported that one side or the other wins and is clearly still up in the air. Like Tikrit, no one really seems to know whether Iraqi security forces or Daesh are in control and of which parts, so. Yeah, it's definitely still a complicated situation. So moving into the humanitarian and social crisis, there's been rapid displacement of hundreds of thousands of people. And recently, yeah. there has been news that some of the displaced people are returning to Mosul from camps in all their cities. Can you tell us why this is happening? Sure, and I know that that happened. I mean, for example, my friends in Bashika, which is this mixed majority Yazidi town, there were lots of families from Mosul there, and some of them did go back in the weeks following this crisis. And I think. It's like the safety and security that people felt under Saddam, that in Mosul, there were no longer the Iraq security forces that were randomly arresting people. There were no longer these checkpoints that might pick people out um, for ethnic or sectarian reasons. And so people felt like, oh, Mosul is quote unquote safe, right? And that there are no terrorists. I mean, now the terrorists have become in charge and are trying to govern and it's safe there. I mean, I heard people say that. And there were people in Suleimani that came here from Tikrit that ended up going to Mosul. Half of that is because people run out of money, but that there was this quote unquote calm or safety and security there now. But when people say that, I, just, I can't help but argue that that's short lived. And as many people have said in articles and around that safety ends and that sense of security ends when the implementation of this quote unquote form of what they call justice starts and you're publicly lashed for smoking cigarettes, blah, blah, blah. We've heard all of this. But I, there was, you know, people did go back. I, I do think there are also gonna be huge problems and there are huge problems in terms of services, electricity, fuel, water, in Mosul, no salaries that I think are gonna be and have been to this point difficult for ISIS to deal with. Mm-hmm. Along with the displaced people, there's been a lot of attention to the displaced, talking about the numbers and where they're living and how they're living, but there are still many people who haven't left conflict areas and have just not been able to escape like where they are, not only in Mosul and Nineveh, but also in other parts of Iraq, like Ambar. So yeah. what are these people facing? Yeah, and, and the same kind of applies to places in Diyala. And to an extent, I was in Khanakin and talking to people who had come up from Jalula and Sadia and Muqtadiya and places like that. I think that it's a very, very precarious, difficult situation because what you have in a lot of these towns are Iraqi forces and the Shia militias, Asab, Ahl al-Haq, and the Badr brigades moving into towns and securing them. And then in the anticipation of, you know, upcoming attacks from Daesh, I mean, I'm, this is just an example from Diala. And I think a lot of people are leaving, but a lot of people cannot leave. And those people that are staying are, especially if they're Sunni, are kind of forced to pick a side. You know, you hear reports of families, the sons say, Asaba, the Shia militias and the forces coming to people's homes saying, 
pick up your guns, make a checkpoint, you fight with us or you leave, wanting to make sure people's allegiances and loyalties are in the right place. So I think for a lot of civilians, if they stay in these areas, they're almost forced to choose a side and they're kind of forced to not be civilians. That's kind of one example. And I and there are a lot of other areas, you know, especially south of Kirkuk, Tuz, Hormatu, in the sub-districts outlying that area. You have populations that are living under Daesh rule that are being, for example, like Sleiman Beg, Amrli, and Gija are villages and sub-districts of Tuz, Hormatu that have been taken by Daesh that are bombed almost every day by Iraqi airstrikes. Now, most of those civilians have left, but those that remain are living in a very precarious situation, of course. Yeah, those all pose definite dangers to these people. Yeah. We talked a little bit about the Shika, and in our last yeah. interview, we talked extensively about like Iraq's diversity and how people live harmoniously despite religious affiliations in Little Iraq or Bashika. So we we're wondering, have these interfaith relationships been affected by the recent surge? I'd say not at all. I mean, Bashika is a great example, like Sinjar, which is majority Yazidi and has hosted thousands of Shia and Sunni Turkmen from Talafar. You know, over the past month in Bashika, you had hundreds of Moflawis, you know, families from Mosul, Muslim, Christian, but probably some Yazidis that were still living in Mosul that came to Bashika. And since Bashika is so close to Mosul, even though it's protected by the Peshmerga, it's kind of considered a dangerous zone for NGOs. So you had local NGOs and citizens of Bashika supporting these hundreds of families for weeks with water and food and helping with rent and opening their homes to people. So you had this majority Yazidi, minority Christian Muslim community come together and support the families of Mosul. And I'd say that happened in most, if not all of these minority communities around Mosul, where Mosul families fled. And not only in Bashika, but across Nineveh, there's a really large minority population. Can you speak to how minorities have been affected by the crisis? I think differently because I don't wanna say Yazidis aren't under threat right now, they are, but fortunately for Yazidis, Yazidis are considered Kurds and either were or are Kurds, and you know, this is obviously a highly debated topic, like are Yazidis Kurds and to what extent are they Kurds, which I just won't get into right now, but Yazidis are protected as Kurds by the KRG. And before this crisis started, they lived in disputed territories, but that were pretty much protected by the KRG and the Peshmerga. And that has increased since then. So of course, Yazidis have been kidnapped, they have been killed, but for the most part, and their situation is really awful in Bashika and Sinjar in terms of services and this and that, but fortunately, the majority of Yazidis to this point have been safe because they are in KRG protected areas and, and Christians too, for the most part. Uh, you know, and, and of course, the new topic about Christians, this tragedy of the last uh, couple hundred Christian families being forced to leave Mosul. Um, so I think in terms of the minority Yazidi Christian situation in Nainoa, they have been threatened, kidnapped, and in instances killed, and are living in a very bad situation in terms of services and uncertainty, of course. A lot have come to Suli, to Ar Suleimani, Erbil, and a lot in Dohuk, and I'm sure a lot will emigrate or have emigrated. But because you have the KRG security protection, you know, there haven't been these huge massacres like you've seen in the Shia Turkmen community. I mean, there has been no more affected group than Shia Turkmen in this conflict. And I think that's something that I, people have written about it and it has been talked about, but the massacres that have occurred in Amrli, which is a sub-district of Tuz Hormatu, that is majority Shia Turkmen, in Talafar, in Bashir, you know, which is south, like a southwest of Kirkuk, mm -hmm. other than, you know, these things that have gone on to Crete and the massacres of ISIS in bigger cities. But, you know, the Shia Turkmen got caught in like a vacuum, you know, they were areas just outside of KRG protection 
and extremely vulnerable areas. And they have borne the brunt of this in terms of minority ethno-sectarian group. Not that she, I mean, she are the majority in Iraq, but these Shia Turkmen have really gotten caught. You know what I mean? Yeah. And they are actually the group right now. It's very interesting that they have migrated heavily to Najaf and Karbala and areas in Southern Iraq to seek refuge. Interesting pop- population shift demographic shift there. Yeah, definitely. The phrase that's been used recently in the media, particularly towards Christians, is that what's been happening in Iraq with the minorities can be seen as a modern day Holocaust. So what do you think about use of this phrase to describe these communities? As devastating as the impacts of, you know, Daesh or ISIS entry into Mosul and Nineveh have been, hundreds and thousands of minorities have not been killed. Thousands have since 2003, certainly. But even more, as you just said, tens of thousands have left. This is a massive exodus of Christians, Yazidis. I mean, you go to towns in Nainoa that are Yazidi, and people will say 50 or more percent of the population is now in Germany or in Europe. So you have massive internal demographic shift. Minority populations in Mosul going to villages and areas outside Mosul and the KRG, Sheikhan, Suleimania, Erbil, Dohuk, and then also populations moving abroad. And you know, even in the last month and a half since this started, of course you've had minorities, Christians, Yazidis, Shabak, Mandeans, I mean, have been targeted and killed and kidnapped. But there have not been massacres of these populations, I would say with the exception of Shia Turkmen. I think you could use the word massacre there for what happened in Tel Afar and Amrli and Bashir. So I think, yes, as you mentioned, it's more of these forced displacement. That's the biggest change or shift. How do you see that this breakup diversity will impact Iraq? Yeah, I mean, I, I worry that it's labeled as this violent sectarian state. Diversity is a great thing for a state, and that is declining rapidly in Iraq, and the narrative is becoming more Sunni versus Shia, and intolerance, and non-cooperation, and total disharmony, which is not in line with the history of Iraq. So you have this kind of narrowing to the Sunni versus Shia battleground in Iraq and and this radical quote unquote Sunni ideology. So let's shift to the political developments. Uh, Recently, there has been a lot of buzz from the Kurdistan regional government about independence. The KRI is already semi-autonomous and has its own government and is in a sense independent. So what is stopping them from becoming an independent state? What obstacles do they face that yeah. keep them you know, a part of Iraq? Yeah, I mean, I think answer one is an independent revenue source. And number two is geopolitics. You know, Iran does not want Kurdistan to be independent. OK, so when you see some of these PUK, one of the Kurdish political party leaders out saying, oh, maybe we should wait this and that, I mean, They might just be saying that because they know if the KRG becomes independent, Masoud Barzani and the KDP will be more powerful and they don't want that. But they also could be influenced by Iran. You know, Iran and the PUK have a very close relationship and a very important relationship to the PUK. So if Iran puts pressure on the PUK to oppose independence, it is something they have to heed. Just like when Iran puts pressure on the PUK to fight Daesh or ISIS in Diyala. So, you know, they have to listen to this quote unquote advice. And also there were these rumors and quotes going around that Turkey supported. They can decide their own fate, the Kurds. But then, you know, a week later, they said, we don't support KRG independence. So we don't really know about Turkey. And I think lastly, in terms of the Kurdistan economy, if they want independence, they have to produce more oil and the revenues have to be coming here. Because until now, all of their revenue comes from Baghdad, everything. So if they can develop the oil and have an independent revenue source through oil exports, that would be another piece to the like independence puzzle. But that, you know, they can't pay salaries now because they haven't gotten the money from Baghdad, the oil money. So until they can pay those salaries on their own, 
then you know the, the same problem that we have now with no salaries will exist after a declaration of independence. And what happens to trade with Turkey and trade with Iran if there's a declaration of independence? I mean, 80, 90 percent of the goods here are from Turkey. I mean, you walk into any store here, you see the buildings here in Suli. You know, it's like you're in the suburbs of Istanbul. So and the U.S. also, of course, plays a big role. I mean, a lot of people have said, oh, stop listening to the U.S. But if the U.S. says no, 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 you have to wait. Independence now will further destabilize Iraq. I mean, the KRG should listen to that or has to listen to that, I think. Um, and I do think there are also internal, of course, Kurdish divisions, um, KRG politics. I mean, there are divisions everywhere, but the, the KDP and the PUK have somewhat, you know, come together over the years, but there's still a lot of internal political factions in, in the PUK and, you know, a lot of uh, tension between the PUK and KDP. So these are all things that need to be worked out. I mean, those final things could be worked out in a state, but... You know, the, the, the former points about geopolitics and about economy, I think, need to be solved before, maybe. Yeah. And in the event that they could solve these problems and they were in a position to move uh, for independence, <laughs> would it be beneficial to Iraq as a whole if Kurdistan was independent? Yes. I, I don't think it would solve political problems in Baghdad, but... And I absolutely am not criticizing this, but Kurds in Baghdad always put Kurdish and the interests of Kurdistan first, and that is fine. But there are many cases in the past of how that can be detrimental or, you know, just have small negative impacts or just not positive impacts for the state of Iraq. Now, I think there are probably 800 other things that I would need to think about if I was going to like right like why kurdistan leaving iraq is better for iraq you know there are a lot of issues at play there but i mean my first answer would be uh, yes great let iraqi politicians solve these things on their own without the kurds playing to their own interests recent events um like the dismissal of a kurdish foreign minister yeah and finger pointing by maliki that the kurdish government is supporting isis has caused rising tensions between Baghdad and the KRG. So can you tell us about the current relationship between Baghdad and the KRG? Yeah, it's just very bad. I mean, (laughs) you know, like they suspended cargo flights from, I heard they might be back, but you know, they suspended cargo flights from Baghdad to the KRG, which means no DHL, like, for example, no books for universities and things like this. So I think it's kind of a back and forth. I think the KRG is looking out for its own interests right now, and that is agitating Baghdad. You have a lot of opposition leaders in Erbil talking about a salvation government, an alternative government to Maliki. Um, So I think any leader of any state sees that happen and is going to lash out or criticize those moves. But, you know, I think the the relationship between Barzani and Maliki between Erbil and Baghdad has been in decline for a while and is now just significantly worse. And have these tensions affected government formation? Yeah, I mean, you mean the the Erbil Baghdad tensions yes. affected? Yeah, I mean, I think that the fact that the Kurds want Maliki out and Maliki will not leave is a problem. I mean, but that's not just the Kurds. There's this fairly widespread, not totally widespread, um, demand for Maliki to step down as prime minister, but there's not been a viable replacement from his party. So I think those tensions have contributed, but it's one part of this broader struggle that will Maliki leave? Will he stay? You know, There's a struggle over the speaker. There's a struggle over the prime minister, a struggle over who will be president. So I I, I wouldn't blame the government formation on the Kurds. These are problems of Iraqi politicians that cannot compromise and cannot negotiate and refuse to give any little bit of their position to anyone else. I mean, and the Kurds are a little bit included in that, too. I mean, they, they can't communicate. They don't trust each other. They can't get along. So that's the problem, you know. No, definitely. Looking to the future, where do you see the security situation headed? Considering 
the inability of the Iraqi security forces to retake Tikrit after over, I think it's been three weeks now, and the continued advances of Daesh, of ISIS and Anbar, moving through Salahdin over toward Diyala. I think there's going to be a lot of fighting for a long time. There is no clear winner right now. There's no one that is 30 points ahead in the basketball game. And if there was, it wouldn't be the Iraq security forces. And with the total lack of decision-making and leadership, I mean, there's just no government. There's been no government formation. So that combined with what's going on on the battleground, I think means a lot of fighting for a long time. And what impact do you think that the crisis will leave behind, particularly in terms of the humanitarian and cultural crisis? I mean, it's just going to be devastating. I mean, I I look at Syria now and I think, how are these cities ever going to rebuild? How is this country ever going to rebuild? And I and now I look at Iraq and I look at Tikrit and Mosul and, you know, significant infrastructure is destroyed. You've had massive displacement. You, you think about decades of infrastructural rebuilding, decades of building another middle class. But I mean, you know, most of the Iraqi middle class and middle upper class was already gone. So I just think it's a huge another setback in terms of population, demography, infrastructural building, institutional building. And also, I, I think the worst part is about the population. I mean, at Iraqis, they're Sunni and Shia, and everyone says, oh, they don't like each other. But the, among Iraqis, they still do like each other. But what happens after these conflicts is there's more and more killings and murders and massacres, and that creates more tensions among a population that didn't used to dislike or be suspicious of the other sect or other ethnic groups, you know? Yeah. And that takes time to get over and I think that is a sad repercussion of this. And finally, um, yeah. in conclusion, what will push Iraq's recovery? The problem right now is that the violence is so bad and the displacement and the humanitarian situation is so bad that I really think no recovery can happen until this violence stops mm -hmm. and I can't see when that happens. So in terms of drivers and actors and parties and groups that will push Iraq forward, it's so hard to even think about because the country is in such a massive crisis right now that it's about bandaging, you know, humanitarian crises. There, I mean, the, the NGOs here are so overextended and there are not enough money, there's not enough people, there are not enough camps. Hundreds of more families show up in every camp, you know, every day. So it's very hard for me to say, you know, oh, this person or this group can fix this because what we need now is like an end to this violence. And I, but I, and I do think that there needs to be an inclusive government, a, a representative inclusive government and leaders that can then serve as a precedent and as a role model and say, we have a united government here. And especially to bring strong, quote unquote, Sunni leaders into the forefront on TV, talking to their constituencies. I think that is very important that Sunni political leaders and even Shia political leaders like Ayatollah Ali Sistani come out and they say, we are all Iraqis, we need to come together and we need to fight terrorism. I mean, that needs to happen more often. Secular statements, Sunni, Shias, we're all Iraqis, we need to fight terrorism together. And again, I would say Ayatollah Ali Sistani is a great example of that. It's such a devastating situation right now that beyond saying, we need to take care of the refugees, increase humanitarian aid and stop this violence. That's the only thing I can see right now. Christine, thank you so much for being with us here on Iraq Matters. No, oh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It was really great to have Christine on Iraq Matters today. I'm so happy you had a chance to talk with Christine, and it's so timely given recent events with the fall of Mosul and also more recently what's happening in Sinjar. Me too. It was a great conversation. Well, a lot has happened in the last two weeks since you talked with Christine. 
That's true. As Christine described, Syndrome Mountain is a patchwork of areas. Some of the areas are controlled by ISIS or Daesh, and other areas are under the protection of the Peshmerga. It's a dynamic situation where sudden changes can affect the safety and welfare of the communities that Christine described. Over the past 72 hours, we have seen one of those sudden changes following clashes between ISIS fighters and Peshmerga forces. Areas previously held by the Peshmerga, like the city of Sinjar, which Christine mentioned, have now fallen to ISIS. Militants have also advanced on Zumar and Wana and pose a threat to the Mosul Dam, Iraq's largest hydroelectric dam. These affected districts around Sindra Mountain are primarily inhabited by Yazidis, Shiite Arabs, Christians, Shabaks, and other ethnic religious minorities. As a result, I mean, you can imagine, we've heard the reports of the widespread human rights violations, especially directed towards these minority communities. So with the arrival of ISIS, it's forced 40,000 or more people to flee their homes. And many of those who have fled are reportedly trapped behind ISIS-controlled areas without access to water, food, or medical supplies. And Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have both just issued emergency alerts because they fear what will happen to these civilians that are now under ISIS control. Since the fall of Mosul and seizures of cities like Tal Afar, there have been reports of atrocities committed by ISIS fighters who have targeted Shiites and minority communities like Yazidi, Shabaks, and Christians. Of those who have fled, we've heard from Ocha that at least 30,000 people have made it safely to Dohuk, which is in the Iraqi Kurdistan region. Though tens of thousands have fled, there are many who are still trapped in ISIS-controlled territory and now living in cities held by ISIS because the population in this area was over 300,000. Wow. I think given what we're receiving with these reports, it's a really important time to call your lawmakers. Senators and representatives are home right now because of the August recess, so it's a great opportunity to just show up at their local offices and express concern and urge them to do more. Prior to this new wave of forced migration, the estimated total of Iraqis displaced so far this year stood at 1.2 million. So that number is rapidly rising. For more about the human rights and humanitarian crisis in Iraq, we invite you to check out a new series of blog posts by our EPIC research intern, Mark Edman. Now for a brief update on EPIC's fieldwork. EPIC is currently working on two projects, Photo Voice and Tent Ed. Both of these projects are funded exclusively by private donations from supporters like you. So Eric, can you tell us where we are with these initiatives? Well, let's start with Tent Ed. I'm so excited about what our colleague, Zach Bazzi, has been able to achieve. He literally arrived in Erbil on June 7th. Well, the city of Mosul fell on June 10th. So right at that moment, when the needs are dramatically increasing, the numbers are dramatically increasing in terms of vulnerable populations in Iraq, um, he was there immediately to implement that project. And for June and July, he worked with a lot of local partners, he connected with the Syrian refugee families themselves, with aid workers. One organization in particular, the International Volunteers of Yamagata, um, this is a group that's based in Japan. The group which the acronym is IV. So IV and Zach identified an opportunity right there in Erbil. We're talking about lots of Syrian refugees who are actually based there in the city. And because these families don't have a lot of resources, they have challenges to be able to afford the bus transport for these kids to get to the school. And so what Zach was able to do with Ivy, they are working with 200 Syrian refugee kids, providing uh, assistance for bus transport, school uniforms, and school materials. And as a result, these kids are now able to continue their education. So this is a huge achievement. In addition, Zach also connected with some of the tented schools at Domiz camp, which is Iraq's largest refugee camp for Syrian refugees. And an example of one of the things that he was able to do, because it's in the Kurdistan region, so a lot of the local textbooks are all in Kurdish, what the problem is is that these Syrian refugee kids, they speak Arabic, and for them to have to master another language really is a huge setback in their education. So he was able to work with the schools to purchase hundreds of textbooks in Arabic and also provide other assistance for these schools. So it's just really exciting to see that kind of progress with this project that's, again, completely funded by private donations. That's really great because this is the difference between the kids going to school and not going to school, and it's really great for them to be able to continue with their education. Absolutely. Now, moving on to Photo Voice Iraq. I was there not too long ago at the end of their semester working with the students at American University of Iraq, Salamania, and with their teacher, Sasha Kraj, this award-winning photojournalist. These kids are really amazing. I mean, 
What we've been doing is we've been going through all of their photos and the written reflections that they've developed, and we're now in the process of creating the first exhibit. So they will soon have their international debut. It will be an exhibit here in Washington, D.C., and then we'll follow up with exhibits that will be there in the Kurdistan region, including at the next Suleimani Forum early next year. So it's really exciting to be working with these students, and I've already told the students that at each of these exhibits, when people come and view the work, they will be getting reviews, and whatever student gets the highest reviews, we're planning on then working to bring that student here to Washington, D.C. to meet with professional photographers, photojournalists, meet with top universities, get a really rich experience that can continue to support their career development. That's really exciting. It's definitely going to be a great trip for whoever ends up coming here. We love hearing from all of you, so please visit us online to share any feedback, questions, or story ideas that you have. You can visit us via our website, Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. We also encourage you to subscribe to our iTunes and Stitcher channels, where you can get new episodes the moment they're put online. And don't forget to share us with your friends. This is Asha. And this is Eric. Reminding you that Iraq, Iraq matters. matters. Thank you.